Hi, I'm Chloe Levine, and you're watching the Point of Experience podcast. Today, we get to chat with one of my longtime friends, one of the first people I got to work with professionally on camera in this industry in like a real film, uh, a film called Knives with Aaron David DeFazio and Peter Friedman, who most of you might know from uh, Not Severance, the other one, which is Succession, a great show. Uh, Peter is on that, Mark Menchaca, who got on to do... Uh, a ton of amazing things, um, including Ozark, um, Manifest. He's such a phenomenal actor, but also Chloe Levine today, who was kind of like my scene partner and best friend in the film. And from the moment I saw her work, I was like, this person's the real deal. She kicks butt. She's confident and uh, has gone on to be in things like the OA on Netflix, uh, Trinkets, Tons of films and guest stars like in Mr. Robot, The Deuce, Bull, High Maintenance. She has just been having such an awesome career and now she has been doing a lot of directing and producing and writing and making her own content, including her own film right now, her short film called Bloom, um, that she's doing a seed and spark for and we talk all about what she's doing. But um, I want to just say this up front because if you're listening and you don't make it all the way to the end for whatever reason, um, you can donate to her seed and spark, which is about has about two weeks left in it. Um, the link is in the description um, and it is tax deductible. Um, they're working with a fiscal sponsor. So if you do a donation, you can write that off on your taxes. So please check out the seed and spark but without further ado um you're gonna go ahead and like and subscribe to our stuff and you're gonna do all that great stuff for us and then you're gonna stay right where you're seated or you're gonna continue that run or that drive and you're gonna watch me and chloe levine chat on the points of experience podcast coming up right now I'm actually, I'm looking up really quickly. I want to know what year we did Knives because this is actually going <laughs> to, so, okay, so it came out in 2014, so we probably filmed this in 2013. That's crazy. Wow. 10 years. It's that been 10 so years. Crazy. Holy cow. How old were you when we did Knives? Mm, 15, 2014. 15? Wow. Six, yeah. Because I was in high school. That's crazy. Yeah. So you're like a completely different human being right now. My cells have changed over. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. I mean, I was in my mid twenties at the time playing obviously 15 or whatever, which is still something I'm, I'm very used to doing, but that was, I remember seeing you in that film and, and working with you on the, did we ever do, do we do rehearsals or do we meet like on set? I can't remember. Yeah, I think we met on set, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. It's it's been a minute, like we just said. But yeah, <laughs> I just remember. I remember even for you at that age, and you'd obviously been acting for a while. That's why I'm I'm really curious, and I, I, I want to talk about your start and all that stuff because, uh, you at such a young age, you were just so good. Like I remember, <laughs> like acting with you and just thinking, like this person, and maybe this isn't the case, but you just seemed so grounded and so in yourself and you knew kind of your style and you had a sensibility about, okay, this is the, the wheelhouse that I function in and I know what I'm doing and I know that I'm, I'm good at it. That's at least the way it appeared to me. I'm like, oh gosh, this person gets it, you know, <laughs> did it not, was that, not that way. Um, <laughs> is that not the case? Is that not how you felt? Maybe is that yeah. how you felt then? Or is that how you feel now? Or do you still have insecurities about things? I think that, you know, insecurities are just so a part of mm, being a human being but yeah I I feel like my philosophy with acting is just everything that you need is already inside of you you know mm. you you come completely able to do whatever you're trying to do and it's actually really easy like you just need to show up and do it and you are enough as you are you know what I mean um so hopefully maybe that's what you're picking up on because I've thought that for for a while which I think has been beneficial in multiple ways you know having that that's sort a, of mentality. Yeah, that's a very, it's a very mature thing and a very, not many people at that age, nor even at my age now still have that, still can pick up on the fact that, you know, you are enough and everything that you have is, is inside you is unique and it is worth being seen. And especially from an artist or performer perspective, it's like you have something that is 
uh, inherently unique that nobody else can do. And I think everybody tries to fit themselves into the various boxes that they think they should be in. But uh, for you at that age is to have that idea. Where did that come from? Where did you find this (laughs) self-worth? I don't know. No. (laughs) Um, Well, I have been training at the Barrow Group since I was like 13 or 14. And that's a big part of their philosophy, which is just like, don't try. You got it. It's chill. Like everything you have or you need it, you already have. It's like, it's totally fine. And it makes acting so much easier. It makes being an artist so much easier because you just need to kind of show up and do it and just trust, like, just trust yourself, you know? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I try to do that. I try to, sometimes the, my demons get the better of me, but there, there are moments when I fit into that pocket of like, yeah, what I'm doing is what I want to be doing. And if the production producers, directors, they don't like that. It's not right for this project. That's fine. At least I know I'm giving my best possible take on a, on a character. And Mm -hmm. if it's not right for this project, maybe it'll be right for another one. Um, because Mm -hmm. you can, you can try and fit into this mold that's written in like the character breakdown that everybody else, all 900 (laughs) other people auditioning are trying to do too. And I don't know if I'm good enough to, to beat up these people who just are technically, you know, savants. They're just like technical savants and they can, they can really Mm -hmm. make it convincing that they feel a certain way. I have to do a lot of homework. I have to really, you know, make things believable for myself. And I think like what you're saying is that starts with you, you know, you have to start for, for people like me and like you, you know, it's starting from you makes it a lot easier because you can, associate and assimilate with things that the characters are, are are experiencing a little bit more closer to home in whatever way that's possible for you when did when did that type of training was it at the barrel group where because you, you did you start acting when you started training at the barrel group or did you start acting before you started going to classes I started acting because my older sister was an actress I started acting when I was like around five or six wow okay job as an actor which is so funny to say and then um, so that's when I started and then, you, you know, I was in school obviously, and I wasn't doing so, it as much until, you know, 15 or 16. So it was when I started training that, you know, it brought me back to that. So I, I was acting a little bit and then I got the training going and this philosophy going. And that's when I really sort of like decided, you know what I mean? Yeah. Did you decide that? Was there was there a moment in your life where you're like, okay, I'm I'm doing school. I had done this when I was younger, that I really like this and I want to make it a career. Or was it more just from a hobbyist perspective where you're like, that thing I did was fun and I want to keep having fun. Or did you have this idea of when I'm older and when I'm having to you know make money and provide, I want to be doing it as an actor. Did was that something that you had made that decision of yet or no? Yeah, I think I did make that decision because I was like, this is the most fun I've ever had. (laughs) And I was, I was, I remember being on sets as like a young teenager and being like, these are the coolest people I've ever been around. And then going back to school or whatever, high school and being like, you know, this is fun, but I was just, I just had this amazing experience and I want to go back to doing that. You know what I mean? Like it was it yeah. almost you feel like there's another option. Yeah. I mean, high school is definitely a lot different than working on a set. I, I yes. a, <laughs> especially when you're an actor. I feel like, you know, there's a little bit of you you and when you're working with these older people who are doing this for a career and they're treating you like you're an adult and it's not whether or not you have the new shoes on or if you're talking to this group of people. It's like everyone mm-hmm. just treats you as kind of an equal. You're on the same, you know, ship trying to make something great. High school really is like survival the fittest. Was you know yes. was that yes. was that your experience in high school? Well, I I had kind of a unique experience because I moved from northern New Jersey to Manhattan when I was fourteen. Okay, so I was in like this huge big high school that was definitely what you're describing. This sort of like survival of the fittest, all of the cliques and everything. And then I moved to um, School of the Future, which is a charter school in Gramercy Park. Okay. And they're just like so wonderful. I mean, you know, it's still high school, but it's it was like a very cool experience, especially coming from the burbs. I felt like 
I remember thinking like, wow, everyone here is like the cool kid in my old high school, you know? Like, <laughs> and it was a very small, small school. It was like, I think there was like 80 kids in my graduating class. And just being in the middle of a city, you just sort of like, everything's different. The way that you yeah. do everything is different. And everyone's so much more independent. And I, that really like had a mark on my experience. Where in Jersey did you grow up? You said Northern Jersey? Yeah, Bergen County. Oh, yeah, sure. Bergen County. I know Bergen County. I mean, I grew up in uh, Monmouth County and then, uh, yeah, I, well, I grew up in New York in Brooklyn and then my family moved to Monmouth County when I was like uh, seven or something. So I spent the majority of my time okay. in Jersey. But seeing what life is like, seeing people in the city and what their interests are and what they care about compared to like the suburbs, it's a very wild, different set of um, – I. It's just interests are very, very different. Did you experience that just when you moved to the city? Like it's more art centric. It's more about culture and uh, not so much about like <laughs> not that not that this doesn't exist in the city, but it's not so much about like sports and the popularity or things of that nature. Did you experience that difference when you moved? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, we did have sports teams at School mm. of the Future. But it was so, like, um, it was kind of removed from the culture, from the high school culture. And the people who played sports, because it was kind of, like, difficult to get to the field and to find places to practice and stuff, like, I felt like they really just loved the sport. And it wasn't about, yeah. like, the popularity aspects of, of you know, high school sports. I, I, yeah, I remember noticing that, which is just so interesting that it's, like, it's really kind of harder to do some things in the city, yeah. so you have to like really love it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you you were at the school of the future. What was the name of it again? The school of the future. School, yeah, school of the future. Wow, what an awesome name. <laughs> yeah. uh, was it? Is that a performing arts high school? No, it is not a performing arts high school. It's a charter school, so they do things just slightly differently. Like, well, it may have changed since I graduated, but. Um, they used to not take the regents at the end of the year. And mm. instead we would do like exhibitions, which is like, um, you write a huge paper and present it to some teachers and your peers. And that kind of decides if you go to the next grade or not. Oh, you said exhibition. I thought maybe you had to like fight somebody and see if you had the, oh. you know, <laughs> the skill to move on. You had to do a, <laughs> a monologue off to see if you, you're worthy to make it to the next year. No, that sounds oh, yeah. fascinating. <laughs> Um, so when did you get your first job, professional job when you, since moving to the city and deciding to pursue acting again, what was like the first professional job you had, um, with this newfound sense of, of purpose? I think I did this movie and I think it may have been around the same time as Knives, maybe, no, it was probably before, but I did this movie called Innocence. Mm. Um, and I remember being like so shocked that I got it. I remember being like, what? Really? You know, um, and yeah, that that's the first time. And it gave me like this new sense of confidence as a as a young teenager and I just had so much fun working on it. I we had some like stunt stuff going on with it and some some prosthetic makeup. I remember. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's kind of a cool movie. I mean, it's a great movie. And um, that was the first time that I remember being like, oh, really me? You know? And that yeah. really sort of like drove me to really pursue it in a serious yeah. way. Yeah. What do you, were you auditioning for a while before you got that? What What made you feel like, wow, I can't believe I got this? You said you felt like shocked. You couldn't believe it. Why did you feel and, that way? I think because... I was maybe like 14 or 15 and I just felt so awkward in my body. Mm. I felt like so like far away from myself in the way that I think is really common when you're a teenager. And it was this huge boot. It was a huge production and I had met with the director and I really liked her and the way that she thought about things. And I was like, this is so cool. Like there's no way, you know, there's no way I'm going to get it. <laughs> and then I did. And I think, I think, yeah, that was like a turning point for me. I was like, oh, like what I did was good enough. And then, you know, that is really the driving 
that that bug you know i think i think when you get that cosign from booking a job it does give you that confidence boost to say because i mean you audition so much and you're like okay something i'm doing is right or there's something about me that is interesting enough that people want to hear hear it from me or from my perspective <laughs> and that that it can be very affirming and give you a really great confidence boost uh, it, it makes me curious like what kind of kid were you what were your interests because when i had when we when we met on knives i felt like you you had even i guess i i don't even know if i knew how old you were at the time but you just seemed so like and i mean this as a compliment you seemed like punk rock in a way you know like oh. you, you had like that little bit of that quality to you um mm -hmm. you know you had like really cool hair and it was like i think you had it like it was bleach blonde right your hair was bleach blonde yeah. at the time i think you had like a choker on or something like i'm you know and like bracelets and everything that seemed very like punk rock and you, and you had that kind of like chill demeanor to you too you feel, seemed very confident was that like how you were as a kid or like what was the things you were interested in I was so weird as a kid <laughs> <laughs> it was so strange like and um yeah I guess this part isn't weird but I was really androgynous for a really long time on purpose I cut my hair really short and I wore a lot of men's clothing and for a while I went by um CR like because my middle initial is Ray I was like uh -huh. Floyd doesn't really fit so I think I want to go by CR and um which I think is a totally natural normal thing for everybody to go through just like hmm, what is my identity and people used to call me inferno fire because that was my freaking online gamer tag so <laughs> kids, kids, kids do kids do weird stuff yeah. and it's just fine it's part of life so it's 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 weird being a kid and sort of like figuring out you know what it means to be a person and yeah. um so i because i was sort of like very different from most people in my school i was like the freak the weirdo I was bullied a lot Ooh. and um, I think that it just, it was awful of course. And, and, but I think that it also made me be like, like made me like, like have, I was like, whatever I'm doing is different from what you guys are doing. And I'm happy about that. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that sort of sense of, okay, I don't want to be in that group anyway. Like I like yeah. what I'm doing over here. If conforming yeah. means you have to be making other people feel shitty and trying to make them feel like different and less than, like why would I want to conform to being like that? That doesn't seem like the cool group doesn't seem like a happier place to be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I I remember just being like, ew, like I no, I <laughs> like I'm wearing like <laughs> okay. Um yeah. yeah, so that's yeah. No, I, I mean, I was kind of the same way. I mean, I, I I was a bit of a chameleon where I was able to kind of like pretend like I might have fit in certain groups. But then like the second I let my guard down, they'd be like, wait, what the fuck did that kid just do? And I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm just I'm just kidding. I'm just fucking video games and card game. Like, what are, what are you talking about? So I was able to kind of mask a lot of my weirdness. But that came out of very like that came from a lot of restraint to try to act like I was something that I wasn't when deep down I was. And it took me a while to find that confidence. So I know how that that can feel um wh what was it about acting and movies and tv what kind of influence did that have on your life to where number one you were you were interested in just it as a whole and what was it about acting specifically that you felt like was fun like what was it about when you're performing that was fun oh my gosh i mean so many things i love the i i remember just being like this is magic like taking an idea, a story, and then like getting all of these like talented people together and everyone leaves their own imprint on it and you make this thing that people can enjoy. Like that is magic to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I was always really drawn to like the idea that I could be other people without committing to those lives. Yeah. You know? sort of mm -hmm. like exploring myself by proxy through these characters yeah those are the things that really stand out what, what about you all of those same things i mean again i think when you talk about being awkwardly 
uh, uncomfortable in your own body and your own skin that defines me to a T. Like I just I hated everything about the vessel that I was given to mm-hmm. to move around the earth. And at that at the young age, I've I've come to yeah. to grow into appreciating myself. But at that age, I just kind of you know I was shorter. I didn't you know I was like uh, pudgy as a kid. You know, it, there was just many reasons for people to pick on me, and very similar reasons that when when you when you're acting and you're kind of and I was very sensitive and vulnerable and when you're for some reason you telling a story on stage and maybe you're crying or you're acting ridiculous and people are like and they're like and they're either clapping or they're just like they feel something from that like that was the first time I felt like holy shit I me this person who kind of like hates all this stuff this is making people feel good or feel something and I was like that to me is magic, you know, that's a very, it's like a superpower. Um, so a very, very similar feeling, but it's, um, yeah, the, the world of movies, TV and film is, is fascinating. Did you, did you do a lot of theater when you were like at any point in time between 14 or did you get straight into movies and and TV and stuff like that? Yeah, I did. I did one play when I was around 16 at Mm. my acting school, the Barrow Group. Like we, we did it there and, but that was the only time that I ever did theater and then you, it was mostly just film and TV. Do you have the itch for that or is there, is there a certain story that you think would, is there like a certain play that if you got the opportunity to do, you'd be like, heck yeah, I want to do that. Or is it just like, does, does the, <laughs> does the monotony and the, like having to do something eight shows a week, does that scare you or anything? No, I mean, I would love love to do a play because I I'm constantly in school too I'm in scene study and I'm always like looking for plays and good scenes yeah um and yeah I think I just read people places and things uh, the play the play it's oh, a play was, yes. okay and that so I did a movie characters. called people places things and I was like wait a second what oh. <laughs> yeah there is there is but it's I yes now I know it's definitely different but yeah. it's a good skill, right? Um, yes. And like, if I could do that play, that would be amazing. It's just like such a good character. And it, it as you can imagine from the title, it deals with like addiction and, um, you know, the program and stuff, which I find yeah. really fascinating. So, but I think, yeah, I think that theater is just, it blows my mind. It blows my mind because it's like, I don't know. I mean, and I've done it before, just like memorizing the whole script and doing it right there. And you have to, you you keep going. Yeah. You, no matter what, you keep going. Yeah. I just think that's like so beautiful. It is. And I think that there, I mean, all acting has a lot of the same threads. You know, you're, you're, you're creating a character in a very similar way and you're preparing oftentimes in very similar ways. But I think in film, you can focus a little bit more on moments and like, what is this moment that we're trying to capture right here where theater, it's like, you got to figure out that ride and what is it? How do I start? That's going to get me to here so that I finish here. It's, um, it's a little bit more of a different process. And do you have a certain process now when you work on TV and film? Is it, is it, do you, when you get like a script or something, is there like a certain ritual that you do in terms of getting ready for a character or getting ready to, to shoot, um, either like before you even get to set or while you're on set? Yes. I usually like, I'll take the whole script and I'll put a map of what I think happens to my character on like a separate, uh, sheet of paper. And usually it looks really cool. (laughs) I try to make it look really cool. Um, and, uh, (laughs) Then I, so I try to figure out the emotional beats that go along with the map of the story for my specific character. And then I craft a playlist that coincides with that. Like a music um, playlist. Like a music playlist. Yeah. Awesome. And music is just like such a big part. I mean, it's such a gift that we can just like, for me at least, like you can store so many things in yeah. sound. And um, so I really take advantage of that. And then yeah so I have like my little notebook with my map in it and my headphones always when I'm on set just so I'm like on track with what I think uh the beat the beats are and usually I'll work with the director and sort of go over it with them but then I feel like once I'm sort of like settled in what I 
in the map, the like emotional architecture of the story, mm-hmm. then I can sort of like play around with other yeah. things. We can bring other things in if we need. Um, but that's usually the process. No, that's great. I think a lot of people, uh, I'm, a, I'm a very similar way. I like to do a lot of homework in certain capacity. So I feel confident enough to play. Like, I, I feel like if I, if I just try to show up to a set and I didn't really do any preparation of any kind and I try to just like play, I, I feel like there's a very good chance it doesn't, it hasn't happened, but I feel like there is going to be that time where I show up and I'm like, I'm trying really brave things. And they're like, did you, did you read the script? Like, you know, like, do you know what we're trying to do here? And I'm like, uh, I feel like that's like, I, I have I have my own set of trauma from going to auditions once, and I'm I'm not gonna say what casting director said this to me, but I remember I went to this uh, audition, and I took like a bold risk like that. And again, you, when you're auditioning for people who don't know, you have a very limited time. Sometimes, sometimes you get those sides right there. Sometimes you get them a day before, or the day of, it depends. And I show up for this audition for like a guest star, I think, on the show. And I do the scene, and I think I probably felt decent about it. And then the casting director goes to me. He goes, Paul, you know this is a comedy, right? And I'm like, the insult that that Mm -hmm. hit on, because I'm like, not only am I not doing this good, Mm -hmm. I'm not funny. Like, this is supposed to be funny, and I'm not funny at all. And I'm like, I think I was trying to be funny. I was like, oh, no. So that's where, for me, I want to mitigate that from happening as much as possible. I want to, like, try to understand as best as I can what the story is, what the beats. Do you have Mm -hmm. any sense of, um, like, for auditioning maybe specifically, do you have, like, is there something that you do in terms of preparing for something before you've even booked it? Um, Yeah, I think I try to do the same sort of thing, but just not as, um, like, I don't make a map, but I'll just have it, like, in my head, sort of, where we need to go, so where I should start. Um, And... Yeah, it definitely like music is still a part of it, but with something like auditioning before you get the part, it's sort of like you're sort of more in touch or for me I'm more in touch with myself. So I'm like, well this character is really angry, so instead of like assigning a song for a character that reminds them of this specific moment, I'll just play a song that I know makes me angry. Mm, you know yeah. what I mean? And just totally. like cut out the that sort of whole section of work. Yeah. Because yeah. it's, it's helping bridge a, and this is something too that I've tried to do. And, and I think even when I was looking up some stuff of you talking about acting, you said like, you know, bringing yourself to the character in some way. And it's it, it, like, not everybody can imagine what it's like to, um, I don't know, lose their whole family in a car crash or win the lottery. If you haven't experienced something of that similar magnitude, especially in your young life. But if you have something that you know that you've experienced that is like, can get you to a relatively similar emotional state that can be very helpful, especially for auditioning when you don't have all the time or the access to the director or other people involved that can help Mm -hmm. fill in those gaps. So I totally get that. I, 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 I use that a lot. Um, I wanted to ask you too before, and I forgot. Did you do you have like any favorite actors or performances that you like inspired you growing up to kind of pursue this? Like what what um, what were you into from a like an arts perspective as a kid? Well, I am the youngest. I have two older sisters, so I was exposed to a lot of stuff that <laughs> was probably not age appropriate. <laughs> um, but like one of my favorite movies growing up was Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Heck yeah! I just I love that movie so much, and I think John Cameron Mitchell is a huge inspiration to me, especially because he's someone who acts in stuff that he creates. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's so beautiful. And but the but also a performance I think about a lot is um, Angelina Jolie and Gia. Hmm. I just, I like think about that so often. I just think, I think it's so beautiful to watch someone like not be afraid to be ugly. <sighs> like that's, yeah. a, that's a thing. It is. And it takes bravery to do that sometimes. Like mm-hmm. I, I try to do that. I'm, I'm sure you try to achieve that as well in your work. I, I, I remember one time. And I've had to have very emotional scenes before in my career. And I remember one time somebody said something. Maybe it wasn't even the director. They're like, somebody was like, they're like, oof, that's an ugly cry. And I was like, 
Yeah, I was like, you know, like when you're experiencing some insane trauma, I don't think a lot of people are sitting there going, okay, this is my cry face. And it's going to be me just really upset and the tear, one tear drops down. It's like, for me, I'd rather look terrible and experience what it'd be like for me to truly experience what that's like. So what is it for you in terms of feeling ugly like how, how does that manifest for you in your pursuit for that in, in your career what, what are the moments you're trying to to do that in I guess it's just like it's sort of like a vanity thing hmm. you know what I mean like and you know so much of our of this industry and our culture as a whole is, is about the way that we look and yeah. whatever which is just a thing that sort of hopefully can change. But right now we just kind of have to deal with it. So it's kind of like about tapping into that thing and being like, okay, you can go away. Like, eh, I'm going to let that go. Yeah. Um, like I did this movie over last summer where it was so horrific, like what this character went through. And I was mm. crying like the whole time. And it was, I was like, I don't even care. Like, I don't even care that there's, like, it's not... I don't even care that, like, the makeup's all messed up. I'm, like, I'm just here. Just yeah. here. The only thing that I care about is, you know, doing this story justice. So... But it's a hard thing to sort of just turn off sometimes because it's so everywhere. Um, it's really worth it to try to. Yeah. Just in general, too. Like, not even for actors to just, like, be like, and eh, it's just get rid of that yeah you know? it is it's it, and what what about kind of this world of i mean number one hollywood there's just so many expectations they have especially on women on the appearance and things like that mm-hmm. and also now social media where you're being from a, a performer's perspective your what you kind of put out into the world and the attention that you have has a certain currency or value how has that affected you um, in terms of finding your own strength to be your authentic self or to not worry about maybe how I look or how I'm presenting to look? Do you struggle with any of those type of things right now in yeah. your life? Yeah, I think so. I think I think it's just so like heavy. It's so, apart. It's so in the air sometimes that um especially in this industry that is sort of like i don't know i just kind of think that is so arbitrary yeah it actually doesn't really make sense at all like a lot of it is just uh we you know we need someone's height for this you know sometimes it's that yeah sometimes it's you know uh, they need to have a certain amount of instagram followers blah 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 which is i think of that as kind of like Okay, if I don't have enough Instagram followers, then yeah, maybe this isn't the right thing. Like that's if that's what they're valuing. Me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but I think it's good to remember that all of it, even though there are like standards, specific standards that we can maybe name or point out, they are so arbitrary. They are so like out of really nowhere, and like you just can't control it. So you yeah. just have to be happy. Like just be happy, or 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 do things that make you feel fulfilled and that's really it because that other stuff is just like chaos it is yeah like chaos in the background um yeah it's so hard though it is and it is like you're saying it's just kind of bullshit we make up i mean we assign like you know this shoe because it has this symbol on it is cooler than this other shoe that literally functions the same way and that exists in so many parts of society and humanity we just literally assign things that are cool and if you don't uh, assimilate to this certain thing that's cool you're not cool or whatever it might be yeah. it's, it's ridiculous yeah. what are what are, the, what are the things that you do to outside of maybe performing that bring you happiness that you're that you focus on throughout the day like because you talked about you know that's something that is a goal of yours like what are you doing that fills you with happiness um when you're not on set and you're not working um well i love writing i love painting and i've been practicing these things where i'm like i just like slowing down you know Mm. what i mean and i really love coffee (laughs) and i like take time to make like the perfect cup of coffee and like enjoy it you know what i mean and that is like like, how beautiful it is to have this beautiful coffee and like 
you know, I live in New York. It's like such a wonderful city. And just like, be like grateful. It makes everything so much better when you're just like, wow, this is awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like, yeah. Not well, everybody I mean, takes time to stop and smell the roses and appreciate what we have and the little, the little things like that, making coffee. But now for those of the people who listen to this, I, I have to ask, like, what is your, your perfect cup of coffee? What does that entail? What is your, what is your chemical concoction that you do that is absolute pristineness? Um, well, I have a Chemex. Yeah. And yeah, I'm one of those, one of those people. Um, and I, you know, boil the water. I put in like, I grind the beans. Mm-hmm. Put in this, uh, depending how how much I want to make, and then this is the special. This is what separates the the kids from the grownups. Cinnamon, okay. Just a little bit in there, Um, and then most of the time I just drink it black because I am a badass. Okay. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I mean sometimes milk, cream. Yeah. I'm yeah. not a coffee drinker, but I respect that. I, I do that with matcha. I'm very – that's, like, been my my vice for as long as I've drinking tea. Now I'm just on, like, on a huge ceremonial grade matcha green tea kick where I have, like, a perfect ratio of things and the way that I froth. Like, I, I have to, like, mix the matcha with the water first and then put a little bit of oat milk in, and then I put a little bit more hot water in. I put, like, mm-hmm. dashes of vanilla, some agave, and then I top it with foam. And, that, yeah, that ceremony of that is mm-hmm. really a beautiful way to start a day sometimes. Um yeah. What about New York for you is so magical? Obviously, you grew up near New York. I spent I spent almost ten years living in New York City. I live in LA, LA now. What about it for you in this industry? That is it about New York that had a hold over you versus thinking about moving over to you know for someone who doesn't do a lot of theater. What was it about New York that's like I like this too much to not move there? I think because. Well, I'm I'm from the East Coast, so it's I have like a lot of people here, which is sure. so important. And I think that New York, I'm interested in in more than acting. I'm interested mm-hmm. in um, being an artist in general. And I know that that is a thing in LA, but I just feel like I feel like a strong connection to New York, mm-hmm. and. Um, yeah, I just love, I, cause I've spent time in LA and mm. it's so beautiful. It's so gorgeous. There. The weather's nice. Sure. They got, <laughs> they, they've got that going on out here. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess the, the way that someone, someone told me this and I was like, oh, that makes sense. Is that like LA is sort of like a bunch of home, um, a bunch of small towns, like sort of together. Yeah. Which I think is really beautiful. Um, but New York is like just a live like beast that yes. you're just like, inside you know what i mean you go yep. outside and you're like, ah! like you <laughs> feel it you feel it um and that is so important to me the like the energy yeah and i just i guess maybe i haven't spent enough time in la to like tap into maybe la's energy i think you're right exactly about your explanation it's a very accurate way of putting it and LA is great and I I live here now. I've lived here for three and a half years almost, which is crazy. But New York still I I still miss it like that like that siren song that just keeps calling me back and I have a longing for it. And every time I'm there, I'm like I have this feeling of like, why did I ever leave? Like this is it's like a life force. It really is like this Mm -hmm. huge moving beast that you just feel so happy to be a part of. There's energy everywhere. LA does not have that same energy. There's not this buzz constantly. The cool part about LA is that everything is about like Hollywood and stories. And it's like most people here, like maybe more than 50% of the people are involved in this industry. New York, it's everything. You know, you've got business, you've got finance, commerce, you've got art, you've got also uh, culinary. It's everything. New York really is a city of everything. It's not just the arts. And that's great. And also, um, for maybe for somebody, they're like, I want to be fully engrossed in Hollywood and movies and things like that. Um, for me, the only real impetus for me moving here was for doing animation. Like most animation is done out here and video games. That was why I did it. So, but if not, I think I would very much still be in, in New York and doing, um, 
this is a good segue here, but I was doing a lot of indie film. I was producing and I was directing and making, like being somebody who's not just, I, I'm not being degrading by saying this, but the, the literal act of being like a pawn piece in storytelling, like as an actor, like, you know, I'm going to set up the pawns here to do this and they, and the pawns act out the story, but I kind of liked being like the chess player and being able to have a little bit more freedom with how a story is told. And not only with this one story that you've got right now, the short film Bloom that you're doing, but you've produced a couple of other films. You've directed a film before. When did all of this start and where did the inspiration for either writing, directing, and producing happen? Like when did this become a, a big interest of yours? I think honestly, like always. Yeah. Because I remember um, being a little kid and telling my mom that I wanted to be a director, like in second grade. Hmm. That memory. And she was like, okay, great. Sounds good. Um, <laughs> sounds good, yeah, kid. But yeah, I was always making stuff like by myself um, with action figures and like a flip camera. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so uh, when I was in high school, I made my first like film that I was going to show people, which is, it's called Dragon. Um, and that, like, so crazy that it won Best Experimental in the Tribeca Film Institute um, portion of the Tribeca Film Festival for wow. students, which was so, I was like, it's crazy. Um, and can you, can you talk to me about, like, what, what it was about and how you made it? Can you just talk me through that first experience? Because that was the first experience you had really making something, right? Like, well, in, on a, on a yeah. like, a on a professional level, let's say. Well, I, I was in the film elective program at School of the Future, and I had mm. this really wonderful film teacher who's such an inspiration to me still. Uh, and she just, like, gave me this confidence. Uh, and I had this idea, because we were moving out of my childhood home, mm. uh, and I had this idea to just, like, document it. And I, I felt like I needed to document it, so it was more like, taking the need that I had and making it into a story. And I had just done The Moth. Do you know what The Moth is? Yeah. Yeah, like the storytelling thing. Yeah. So we had like, um, we had moth people in our high school, like, um, and they did a storytelling workshop with us. And I told a story about my relationship with my dad. And um, so I just took the audio from that. And then I just made this uh, movie about it's about my dad and it's also about I'm I spray painted this dragon on the wall of my childhood bedroom so that's also what it's about um but yeah I just felt like this need to like do something because I was like we're leaving and it's going to be gone and I need something from huh. it so you know I need to talk about it so so that's what drew me wow to that. yeah so that was the reason behind making it, how did you then decide to say, I think this is something I want to submit to film festivals? Or was it just Tribeca that you submitted it to? And why I, did you submit it? I I wasn't going to do anything with it. I showed it to my film class, you know, my film elective. Yeah. And my teacher was like, you know, you should, there's this thing going on, you should submit it. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't think so. And she was like, no, you should, why don't you just do it for fun? Yeah. Um, and then I did, and it and it won, and it got in first of all, and I was That's like, "That's a feat in itself, yeah." <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, so I, it's so interesting the things that were like, "No, I don't think I'm going to do that," and it's like, "No, like do it, like why yeah. not?" Yeah, you, you never know what something will turn into or just the impact it might have on somebody. And I think we often, a lot of times creatives, especially those people who are starting out, we get uh, we have like that impulse to stifle an idea sometimes. And we're like, ah, nobody wants to hear that. Ah, that's stupid. Mm -hmm. When sometimes if you just give yourself the freedom to say, no, I'm going to do this. And I'm not saying it has to, you know, win Sundance, but I'm going to do it. And then if you find yourself in an opportunity to submit it to various things or to get it in front of certain people, you never really know what kind of effect a relation will have on someone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I feel like that is so true. I've been noticing so much how like easy it is sometimes for us as artists to like talk down about mm. our work. Like it's like this, we're like, well, I don't know. I've, I'm guilty of it. I'm like, yeah, but it's stupid. Or it's like, no, it's awesome. It's yeah. awesome you're making something. Like, that's beautiful. Um, 
So I don't know, something I noticed. No, absolutely. I'm I because I, I, I write a lot too, and there's so many times I have ideas, and. <sighs> Sometimes it's not having the right people around you, but sometimes I'll share like an idea that I'm I'm like percolating in my head, and I'll be really excited about it, and I'm like, yeah, I have this idea for like this thing, and I'll just say it to someone, and they'll and even just like their reaction, I take too much account mm-hmm. into like what their reaction is based off of whether or not this is good. And Allie, my my fiance, she she does it too sometimes. Like she'll tell somebody like like one person who maybe's in the industry in a higher position because she is a writer, and um. You know, I'll have the, they'll be like, oh, that's that's cool or oh, OK, that's kind of interesting. And they're not like, oh, my God, that's so cool. Like the way you feel about it. And then all of a sudden you've reconstructed your whole thought process mm-hmm. about how you feel about something based off of maybe someone's accidental interpretation of it. Maybe they're going through a bad day and maybe it's just not for them. And then all of a sudden we we say, no, nah, OK, no, nah, I'm not making that anymore. Oh, nope, stupid idea. Everyone's going to hate this. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'm guilty of that. Do you feel like, do you, do you seek out validation for your ideas when you're creating from like a writing perspective? Not really. Because of Good. Like, <laughs> like not really. I usually am pretty close to the best about yeah. things. And I, cause I don't like, I don't, I want to protect it until it's ready to be out in the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, yeah. So, because I've had that happen too many times where I'm like, Oh, you don't get it. And then I'm like, I don't yeah. even get it, you know? And so <laughs> I try to like I just avoid that. But it's also about like, you know, finding the people that you can really share things with and other artists who are sort of like finding your community and your people, I think is an important part of that, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it, having a good support group and circle, I think is like one of the top things that people can do to enrich their lives especially as artists because we are so it requires such vulnerability if you don't have the right people around you that can stifle you in such unproductive ways um but i wanted to also ask you like so you had done that first uh short film or experimental piece then you had gotten involved you had directed your own film or I I saw you attached as a producer for a couple of things. Can you just talk to me about how that journey into producing and then eventually having directed that film that you directed uh, happened? Yeah, I am really interested in just like the producing part of um, just producing in general. And so the last few projects that I've been a part of films, I've just asked if I could also be a producer on it and like, if they would let me sort of learn from them or if they wanted my two cents about things. And most of the time people are really like receptive and like, yeah, of course. And it's really lovely. So I've, I've learned a lot from the past few projects that I've acted in and also produced, um, which is really, I'm just so grateful for that. And I just, we actually just picture locked on blubber, which is a short film that we, filmed this past fall um so that should be coming out soon uh we're in like color and sound right now amazing so i directed that and i co-wrote it um so yeah but all those things that you sort of pick up being on set like and uh, as i said with like the producer like being a producer on things it all sort of culminates when you like make your own stuff yeah you know but so with Blubber, you co-wrote that and you directed. How did that come to be? Was there you and a friend of yours had this idea or you had an idea? What was the inception of how that came about? And how did you actually go from being like, okay, um, well, I don't know if this is the case, but okay, we have this idea. Now we're actually going to make it. Well, my partner, Abby Leaf, who is her idea. She has had this idea for maybe like four years and she wrote a first draft of her script. And, but she couldn't get the ending. Mm. Um, and so she showed it to me and I was like, well, maybe this and this. And she was like, well, um, so we did our own pass of the script a few times, like together, we worked on it together and we finessed the ending. And then she was like, well, you should direct it and I should act in it. So she starts in the movie and I directed it. And, um, yes, it was her idea that I just sort of helped on making like finessing and then directed it and it's, I'm really proud of it so far I mean it's really cool I'm excited for people to see it you know yeah I'm very excited to see it, it, it do you guys have a trailer yet or anything or do you have a plan are you gonna do festivals for it 
Yes, we have some festivals in mind, mm -hmm. like dream festivals, um, but we no trailer yet. We will have a trailer soon. Yeah, it should be done done in the next few weeks, which is so crazy wow. to think about. Yeah. What was what was the experience just being on like the other side of the the lens? Like, not did you also have a, an acting part in it, or did you only direct it? No, I only directed it. And it was so weird. It was actually so funny. The first, because when I had directed before, it's like, you know, me, myself and I with a camera. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so this, we had like a whole crew, a whole set of actors. Um, and I, this funny thing would happen where I would forget to say action. <laughs> because in my mind, I was like, I don't say that. That's not, and then I was like, oh my gosh, action, you know? Um, <laughs> So that was the one thing that was like, hmm. Uh, and cut, of course. Like I just those two things. Yeah, I so think I, there's. I've I've worked with directors who don't say action. Like that's just not part of their thing. They'll just be like, just go when you're ready. And it's like that's a very. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like. I feel like it's almost like too much power, you know, to give like the actors <laughs> or to to not give them kind of a start and go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 a very bizarre feeling when you have that power in in your hands. Um, so that was your directorial debut, correct? And that was what year did you guys start production on that? Um, so we shot that in the fall of twenty twenty two. Wow. Okay, so, so this is brand yeah. new. It's brand new. Yeah. Wow. Um, so we started production like in the summer of 2022. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. So that's, that's really exciting to be coming up on the, like the finality of a project like that. And then to be moving into this other project that I, I'm assuming is m most of your coming from, you know, your own idea or the inception was of yours. And, uh, I want to talk about Bloom here because this is a really exciting time and I think it's helpful for people listening because I've been through the crowdfunding experience multiple times, raising money for short films um, and trying to get something of your own made. And um, it looked to me like from looking on your Instagram, you have your team already in place. Can you just talk to me a little bit about like what Bloom is, why you're making it, where you're at, how did you assemble your team and um, kind of what the next steps are for you in this process? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Bloom is based off of a short story that I wrote a few years ago. And during the pandemic, I really like shaped it into a short film, a condensed short film. Um, and I, so it's about this young girl who is suffering from PTSD, but doesn't realize it. Mm. And this sort of tragic thing happens with people who are suffering from PTSD, especially when they have been abused, which is the case for our character, where they sort of think that they in this tragic way they've been abused and then sort of become the abuser which is the case with our main character her name is riley so the film takes place over one night where she has to sort of a situation arises and she must reconcile with this generational trauma when she sees her dad for the first time in a few years um and her dad is newly sober and like very much okay Whereas Riley is sort of in shambles. And it's sort mm. of that dichotomy of like, you know, the original abuser is okay and fine and living his life and he's doing so well. Yeah. And she is yeah. left with all of like the baggage from 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 him. Um so that is the gist of our story. Um, and we have Patrick Nichols as our one of our producers who actually just graduated from Columbia. Oh um, very cool. Yeah. And then we have Kim Jackson as our other producer. And she, Kim and I know each other because she produced a movie that I acted in and executive produced called Antarctica a few uh -huh. years ago. Uh, so that's where we met. And we have Henry Roosevelt as our cinematographer. So we just have like a great team of people, a great team of like people who support the project and who are interested in telling a very true story about PTSD. And hopefully like, hopefully this story will sort of help to destigmatize the condition and, and people who it's more complicated. Everything is more complicated than I think we give justice for sometimes. Um, 
And so those are the things that I want to explore with it. Yeah, I think a lot of times when you see stories about PTSD or you hear people talk about PTSD, it seems like a very black and white experience where something happened to somebody, like they had uh, an experience in their life and now they are dealing with like anxiety and depression about it. And that's like kind of the broad scope Mm -hmm. of what people, um, or at least in my experience, I've seen be the representation of PTSD. But I do also feel like it's very nuanced and there are different layers to it and the other people involved with PTSD. So it sounds like a really actually fascinating um, story. And um, I'm proud of you for like doing all of this stuff from the creative sense. It's very hard to do and and, and it's a, a testament to being involved in a lot of things and you can kind of assemble a team um, from people who have a shared interest. And you said, you know, you worked on this one film as an actor and then you find a producer and then you maybe work with a director. Um, What has the, what has the crowdfunding or producing experience been like? And can you talk to me a little about like the seed and spark aspect of things? Cause I know your campaign is still going on. So, and just for anybody who might be interested in checking it out, um, like where can they find more information and what is, what is your goal with this whole campaign? Well, we have a bloom Instagram going, it's just bloom underscore the film on Instagram. Um, and we have a lot of information on there. Our seed and spark link is there. Uh, we also partnered with the nonprofit organization NYWIFT, which is New York Women in Film and Television. Um, and they're just an amazing organization that sort of um, supports women, New York women in film mm-hmm. and television. So uh, we're really happy to have um, be fiscally sponsored by them. And that just makes all contributions to Bloom tax deductible, which is just like a nice, easy thing. Like that's I, I love that we can offer that and support NYWIFT as well as they're supporting us. Um, and we have a goal of, it's like, it's just under 20K. Mm. And right now, so I, I checked right before we got on and I think it's like we're at 42% now, which awesome. is great. Yeah, and we have 13 more days of the campaign. So we're, it's a 30 day campaign, so we're a little more than halfway through. And, um, you know, we have perks and everything. The whole crowdfunding thing is so funny. Because it's like, I feel like so, it's just surprising, like, the the, the people who come out to support. Mm-hmm. It's so surprising and wonderful. And I've just been like, oh, my gosh, my friends from this this girl that I knew from high school, like, who I haven't talked to. Okay, yeah, oh, my gosh. Like, it's just so wonderful. And it's just like, so far, it's been such a beautiful process like in the beginning as we as we're in production for the film to like start in this way in such a community you know mm-hmm. to really like be fostered by a community i feel like to tell to tell the story and also like i'm i'm getting messages from people that are like this sounds like a really great story because it relates to me in this way or someone i know in this way and it's like wow like this needs to be told yeah. you know so it's been really beautiful and, and so far, yeah. Yeah, I'm so happy for you. I mean, it, the, the crowdfunding experience is really, it, it, it connects you on a communal level in such a different way because it is truly mm-hmm. like, listen, everybody, I have this idea and I know that like for you to invest in me and my idea, like I really am putting myself out there and it may not be an easy time for you to do that or if you... um you know, in investing in, in someone who you maybe haven't spoken to in a while, like it just goes to show that there's such a need for art and there's such a need for stories to be told. And there really is people out there who are supportive. And that's really the beauty of getting a crowd uh, funded campaign going. So I'm just excited for you and where you're going and all the luck going forward to it. Everybody, please check out the Seed and Spark. We'll put that link in the description and all the stuff here. Um, how much of what do you like? How much of going into produ- production do you have ready or planned out? Do you know where you're going to shoot? How long you're going to shoot? Do you have any of that stuff in motion? Yes. So we are. Well, this is very funny. We're actually going to shoot at School of the Future. Mm. We're going to film at School of the Future. <laughs> Which Full is circle. so wonderful. They're just like so supportive. And so we're going to film some stuff there. Um, and we're looking at some locations. We have some really great locations in the script, some very colorful places. So we want to find like the perfect spot. Um, we may go to like upstate New York and kind of get that suburban feel. Um, so that is what we have so far. And 
it's so wonderful, like, having been an actor for so many years because I feel like being on sets, I'm like, I want to work with you again, you know? Yeah. So I'm sort of, like, bringing everyone together to work on this as well, which has been just such a fantastic process. Yeah, it is uh, very inspiring to make something of your own idea and to assemble a crew and a team. And I, I just, I look so fond, I look back so fondly on the times that I was doing that in New York. And that's kind of, it took me a minute with this pandemic and everything, because a lot of things were just were not possible to get back on that track, mm-hmm. because it's uh, so freeing to be the person who's a little bit of orchestrating, like what the story can be about, that can be a really uh, exciting and stressful experience at times, but I thrive on that it, that excitement. And um, it, it, I actually wanted to wonder, I was wondering, because you worked on the OA, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I believe the creator of that show also acted in the show and they were like very involved in sh- the show running aspect of it. Did, was that inspiring for you when you were on the OA to be kind of part of a set that seemed very, number one, it was a very... Um, ensemble based show and there's like a lot of moving parts and for somebody who had this idea and then to get that made did that influence you in any way for kind of where you are today absolutely i mean Britt marling who her and Zal but wonglich um created the oa but uh-huh. um I've, I've always looked up to Britt marling and i saw her film when i was a teenager called another earth Mm. just something that she created and acted in and I remember being in the theater and being like she did all of this um and she was always like I always thought of her and so it's so weird and like such a beautiful thing that I then was on her show yeah um so yeah definitely um definitely the OA was a huge inspiration in me being like I can do I want to do this I'm gonna do this (laughs) I have stories to tell I have something to say um so I'm really grateful for and for the OA for for many reasons that being one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a great show. Um, Ali, my fiance, was obsessed with it. It was so cool. It kind of had a sense eight feel to it, you know, where there's these group of people who are connected in a certain way, and it really was like a, a, a true ensemble piece show. And I love those things where it's not just kind of. Um, uh, you know, there's obviously times where it's great, you know, it's one person driving an entire story, but when you really get to see a group of people who are experiencing unique and fleshed out and full stories and they all kind of carry their own weight, it's a really mm-hmm. cool um, experience. And then you got to be a part of another show I saw recently called Trinkets. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. What was yeah, that experience trink- like? It was so lovely. I, um, yeah, Trinkets, is, it's for like a little bit of a younger audience, which is always fun to be on. And I was coming in, they had already done one season, so, and they already kind of had this like family vibe. So it was really lovely to sort of be accepted by them. Cause you yeah. know, it's always like a little weird sometimes. So, New kid on the block, yeah. Accepted. Yeah. Um, and um, a lot of my scenes were with Brianna Hildebrand, who is so amazing. Like she's so talented and just such like a lovely human being. Yeah. So, yeah, and we shot that in Portland, too, which is also where we shot a lot of the OA um, season two, which is just so weird, like Portland. but And Portland yeah. is just like an amazing, amazing city. Yeah, I've never been, but I want to, funny enough. I mean, I, I was, I'm going to a convention, and it was in, it was, it's in Portland. And I was like, oh, yes, I get to finally go to Portland. But there's also a Portland, Maine, which I did not know about. So I'm going to Portland, <laughs> Maine, not Portland, Oregon. But uh, yeah. I'm sure Portland, Maine is fantastic too. Mm-hmm. Um, so what what else outside of, um, you know, Bloom and finishing up on your feature has uh, – is there anything that you're excited about as uh, things that you've, you've been in that are coming out? I saw a couple of, like, things in production on your IMDb um, – is that stuff that you've acted in already or you're supposed to be acting in? Like what's kind of the mm-hmm. stuff that's on the plate that's not those projects that you've had your hands in? Yeah, well, there's Alaska, which is a feature that I executive produced and I star in. Mm-hmm. And we did a really sort of interesting thing with that one, which we started filming it five years ago. And we shot maybe like 20% of the movie five years ago. Mm. And then there's a huge sh- shift in the story where um, the things that we shot are actually flashbacks for my character. Ah. So we waited, um, we waited through the pandemic, uh, but 
we waited on purpose and then finished the movie last two summers ago. Mm. And that is all done. And we're looking for like a home for it. Or maybe there is a home for it. I can't say. But that should be coming out soon. And that's like a really sort of trippy, trippy uh, film about it's it's definitely LA is like a character in the movie. Mm. It's definitely an LA movie. <laughs> so uh, that should be coming out soon. And then I did this film, The Sacrifice Game, which uh, I teamed up with Jen Wexler, who I've worked with before. Uh, she wrote and directed it. She also wrote and directed this film that I did a few years ago called The Ranger. And The Sacrifice Game is like uh, 70s boarding school horror thriller so that should that's coming out soon and that should also be wild like a very wild movie um so those are two things i'm really excited about that are coming out that's so awesome i'm so excited for you you know it's it just made me think about like i'm just remembering from like the time in new york like a lot of these movies or even movies that you've been and i feel like i had auditioned for or and i just think of um like um, King Jack, which were you were in, which uh, I've worked with Felix before, Felix Thompson, the the director, and he's just so great. And Danny's a friend of mine. And so like there has always mm-hmm. been like this New York community of like everyone's kind of like, oh, it's it's a very small community, the New York film scene. Did you do you feel that way about like working in New York that you feel like you're seeing a lot of the same faces and you're working with a lot of the same people? Yeah, definitely. And it's really beautiful because it's such a it's a huge city but it also feels so small sometimes and yeah it's kind of awesome that especially like in the indie world there is this community and there is this group of people who are like down to make cool stuff you know what i mean and that's the driving force before it's like but how much money will this make it's like no we need to make cool things um and that i just am so appreciative of the indie film scene here yeah a lot of my the people who are a part of like the teams that I have worked had worked on that film ask for Jane that you did like I so many oh, of the people yeah. like yeah like Josh Fullen was one of my producers on one of my TV series I think Justine might have worked on that too hair and makeup and Noah Brooklyn oh, who yeah. does um uh like set and costumes and things so like it's a very like insular type of world and I really do love and, and miss that about it um and I'm just so excited for you to take this next journey, which is with your short film and anything else that is to come. I think it's um, I hope you keep doing it. I think it's a very uh, number one. I think as a, as an actor, it's it's uh, it's such an aid to be able to be useful in more ways than just a performer. Not like to say that you're not enough if you're just an actor, but I think it opens you up to so much more about the process of making stories or telling stories, like understanding like when like the camera is moving a certain way like how that makes you you look or like if there's a certain you know like your pace and your blocking it just gives you such a whole other perspective to have you have you had that experience having been behind the camera and then now being in front of it again and being like oh i know what they're doing right now oh i know this i know this moment isn't about me like do you have that experience definitely yeah i think definitely i i feel like especially with making movies, things are so technical sometimes um, that it's really important to sort of understand some technicalities of things so that you know, okay, I can't cry super hard or too much where I can't see where I'm going because there's a dolly (laughs) track right there and like I need to not trip. You know what I mean? Like just to be aware of all of these things, there's so many moving parts and it's just so helpful to kind of like have that knowledge of, of what's going on so that you can really like focus on what emotional thing you're going through, but also like have the awareness, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, that's something you don't really think about. I don't think anybody would really have yeah. that kind of idea. You're like, yeah, I just get to get on set. I do what I'm doing and I, and I get to do it however I want. And it's like, no, there's sometimes you're, you, you can only turn a certain way. Sometimes you can't yeah. move. It's, there's these restrictions. Um, it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. I mean, Chloe, this has been such a, an awesome time to like chat with you again. I feel like it's, it's been way too long and I'm just so happy yeah. and, and proud of you and everything that you're doing. It's, it's so oh, exciting. Gosh, thank you. And I can't wait to see your film come to fruition and when it's done and everything i will i will be cheering you on um the whole way through and i can't wait to see what you know your your campaign continue to grow it's so exciting thank you thank you so much thanks for having me this was so wonderful and yeah way too long 
Yes, <laughs> I know. When I'm in New York again, we will meet up. Or if you're in LA, please let me know. We'll we'll grab Absolutely. some coffee that won't be nearly as good as the coffee that you make. That's uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> I usually end the show with people, and this doesn't have to be a uh, a reference or sorry, like a story that is relevant to the entertainment industry. It can be. It doesn't matter. It could be an experience you had walking down the block uh, with a friend, uh, a, a pet, an animal, anything really. But as is the nature of the show, I try to talk about experiences that we have that have kind of shaped us to who we are or make us think a little differently or have given us motivation. Is there an experience that comes to mind um, that you had in your life, whether professional or personal or not, that you feel comfortable sharing that kind of shifted your perspective or made you think about something a little different or brought you comfort uh, that you think sharing might that might give people some um, inspiration or um, even just the idea of the story in general could just be like, oh, that's very interesting. That's fascinating. I never thought about something like that. Um, I know it's a very broad question. So if there's, if it's, yeah, if it's, let me think if anything's coming to mind. Um, shifting perspective. Oh gosh. I know. Don't, like, I'll um, give you. I'll give you one of mine here. Uh, one that I've had recently, just to like give you um, some ideas. So like I've, I've been really kind of ob- obsessive over making sure that I have the right amount of like time dedicated to certain things that I want to do. Right. Like, and I was. I find myself getting upset when, like, I'm not. I'm not able to have the time that I allotted myself to do something. I'm like, I'm, I'm trying so hard to like create these boundaries for myself. And I'm like, these things just keep coming up and keep like taking away from my time without getting too specific about it. And then you realize that sometimes those things that are happening that are external, that are influencing your your schedule or your routine, maybe they're happening for a reason, or maybe they're actually even more important than this thing that you're like trying to obsessively control. And you can be ignorant or blind to things that are sometimes more important because you're so in your own world and you have these blinders on. And, um, I just found myself getting like emotionally like angry or upset because things weren't going the way I wanted to. And then come Mm -hmm. weeks later to find like, oh, I completely missed this entire thing that's happening in my life because I'm just so focused on, without getting too personal about it, but because I'm so mm-hmm. obsessed and, and, and been so like militant about having a certain way. So I think there is value in creating routine and there's value in having boundaries, but not at the expense of being ignorant to like life outside of uh, things that you're trying to achieve in your own personal or professional way. It's it's a, it's a It's an interesting balance and I think it's just, like the only real cure or um, the only real productive way of going about it is just to be aware of it and to meter that Mm -hmm. and to say, yeah, there's nothing wrong with saying, Hey, I don't want to, I don't want to go to dinner tonight or I want to stay in or Mm -hmm. any of these things. But there's also something to be said about, okay, what am I turning down or what am I ignoring or what am I saying is more important than something, you know, it's just a balance to, to, to be aware of. So Mm -hmm. Not really a, a moral of the story here, other than just like it's it's this is life, you know, this is life. Yeah, it, it makes me think of. So I I love obviously acting and and painting and so many creative things, and usually when I get the things that I'm most proud of, like what the way that I access things that are really interesting, is saying. And it's okay that I swear, right? Yeah, of course. I just say to myself, okay, let me try to fuck this up. (laughs) And when that happens, when that happens, like magic happens. Like in a scene, if you're like, okay, I'm going to actually try and be bad. You're like, whoa, wait, hold on. This is great. Or like painting, you're just like, and fuck this. Oh, sorry. And fuck this. It's (laughs) like, holy moly. It's just like you, it's so important to give yourself permission to make mistakes, to fuck up. And then- Usually something really beautiful comes out of it, Mm. you know? That's such a great philosophy. I think giving yourself that freedom and like is kind of just like setting yourself free to a certain extent. You know, you've taken this preconceived notion of how things should be. And sometimes you just got to tell yourself like, fuck it. Like just like it it doesn't matter if this is right or wrong. Just fuck it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I love that. Well, Chloe, this has been so awesome. Everybody, please check out the link that's going to be in like the YouTube description if you're watching it there or head over to 
Chloe's Instagram or Bloom the Film on Instagram and check out the project. Please support it if you are so inclined. And the amazing thing, which is so cool, is that it is fiscally sponsored, which means there is a tax incentive write-off. So if you donate, you can write that off on your taxes. So really, yeah. it's kind of like you're wasting money if you don't donate. You know, you're kind of just like... <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Chloe, it's so good to see you. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your weekend. And I'm just excited for everything to come. It's really just been, uh, I'm really happy I got to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. All right, Chloe, take care. So wonderful to see Chloe after, gosh, a decade. Um, we worked on a film, uh, talk about this in the intro, but Knives was, I really enjoyed working on that film with her and Peter Friedman and Mark Menchaca and Aaron De David DeFazio who uh, directed it. But I just knew that she was special from the moment I got to work with her. Like, I feel like a lot of actors get these opportunities to work with someone when you're like, yep, this person's special. They're going to kick butt. And they're going to just keep going on to make wonderful art. And that's been Chloe. And I've just been so happy seeing her succeed um, and seeing how amazing of a person she continues to be, you know, especially starting in this industry so young. But please, guys, check out her Seed and Spark because it's hard to produce your own movies, especially short films. And uh, it's tax incentive deductible, you know, so it's it's like, you know. Throw a couple of dollars at it, and then when you get time for taxes, you can just say, hey, look at what I did here. I don't have to pay you this money. <laughs> so check that out. The link is in the descriptions, and we would also appreciate if you like, subscribe, and follow all of our stuff as well. Leave a review if so inclined. But great to see you all. We will catch you all on the next one.